Without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker who inaugurates this year's, this season's series. It's Laura M. Seeger. Laura is a PhD candidate in history and philosophy of science at Indiana University, Bloomington. Her research interests include scientific practice and presentation, specifically the role of negative results in science, as well as gender and ethical issues in science. Formerly, uh, she was an engineering student. She earned a BS in biomedical engineering and an MS in mechanical engineering at Wash U in St. Louis. So she's uh, been very busy. Um, I'm always happy to introduce a lecture like this because I heard this lecture at the Southern Association for the History of Medicine when they met in Emory. So I know it's good. And I know uh, you're going to have a good presentation uh, by uh, a very uh, exciting uh, speaker who is going to talk about a topic that I think is unique and interesting, which was why I wanted to bring her here. So without further ado, let's welcome Laura Seeger. Thank you very much for being here. Medicine's appreciation of negative results has changed drastically in the last 30 years, from publicly ridiculing anyone suggesting negative result publication in the 1960s to 70s, to beginning to study the existence of publication bias in the 1980s to 90s, to even founding independent negative results journals in the 2000s. In order to understand medicine's unique evolution compared to other fields of science, I will answer the following questions. What are negative results? Why should they be published? How has medicine changed? And why is medicine special? At first glance, the concept of negative results is easy to understand. If positive results are those that support an investigator's initial hypothesis, the negative results are those that don't. Possibly because of this apparent simplicity, the topic is rarely discussed in scientific literature, and rigorous analysis has yet to be conducted. When the concept of negative results is discussed, it's likely in the format of an editorial, either that of an established journal where the editor is defending, sometimes apologetically, why an article featuring such a result is published in that issue, or the editorial of a new negative results journal where the editor is proclaiming the importance of its founding. The concept of negative results appears outside the editorial only in studies of publication bias, where the topic is briefly mentioned and simplistically defined before moving on to the actual problem of study. Consequently, negative results are presented both formally and informally as a straightforward, easily defined concept, while at the same time, the label is applied to a wide range of data, depending on type of result, field of study, and aim of investigator. As the literature has developed so far, recognized definitions of negative depend only on type of result. Authors typically label a result negative if it's deemed inconclusive, unexpected, or contrary to previous findings. Inconclusive results are statistically non-significant data which do not allow the investigator to reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference between the experimental and control groups. Unexpected results are inexplicable data that do not conform to the investigator's broadly accepted conjectures. And contrary results are data that go against mainstream theory and or fail to replicate previous accepted work. If an editorial on negative results or a study on publication bias provides a definition more sophisticated than merely results that fail to support the investigator's initial hypothesis. It typically identifies one or more of these categories, with the most sophisticated definition identifying all three. Authors of negative results literature assume that investigators in the general scientific community also view negative results as falling into one or more of these categories. And this assumption has been supported by a large open answer survey. While this survey targeted only political scientists who follow a methodology quite distinct from other sciences, the study of population statistics and correlations of voting behavior is similar to several areas of so-called hard science, 
So it's not unreasonable to assume that political scientists' views towards negative results reflect those held by scientists in general. Of course, data may also fail to support the initial hypothesis because it is wrong or due to human and or instrumental error. But this category is typically excluded from discussions of negative results, since erroneous data may just as easily support the initial hypothesis. Thus, it's often argued that the leg labeled negative should suggest at least a neutral connotation when applied to experimental results. And any result, positive or negative, is valuable only if it's the product of rigorous, methodologically sound experimentation. Everyday vernacular, however, is sloppy. Investigators casually apply the label negative to results they consider to be unpublishable for any reason, including error. And reviewers almost always cite suspicion of error when rejecting a paper containing negative results. Beyond the recognized type of results definitions, I've found that whether a result is labeled negative depends on its field of study and where that discipline falls along the continuum of science, from the very theoretical to the very mechanistic. A science with a very theoretical background, such as physics, resides at one end of the continuum. And a typical negative result would be finding inconclusive evidence for a theoretical entity, such as the Higgs boson, although a possible positive result was widely publicized this summer. Psychology may be regarded as an intermediate theoretical science that tests correlations of positive mechanisms, such as a hypothesized relation between Olympic solo sport performance and home country individualism. And a typical negative result would be observing no such correlation. Biomedicine is at the concrete, mechanistic end of science. And a typical negative result would be a trial that shows insignificant or no difference between an experimental treatment and a placebo, such as a phase two study reporting no evidence of Ritalin relieving nicotine withdrawal symptoms. Given that different fields of study look for and value different types of results, it's unsurprising that multiple negative results journals have been founded in specific disciplines, rather than one general negative results journal being founded for all of science. It's also unsurprising that a reader would develop a different concept of negative results, depending on which negative results journal she consulted. A third reason why the label negative is applied to a confusingly wide array of data is that it depends on investigators' aim. For example, one investigator's negative result could be another's positive result, depending on initial hypothesis, such as x causes an increase in y, versus x causes a decrease in y. Of course, observing no change in y would be a negative result according to both these hypotheses. Since positive results are favored by traditional publication venues, investigators may develop positive hypotheses for why their results are negative, or even alter their initial hypotheses after the fact to, quote, spin their results as positive. The choice of initial hypothesis is not an arbitrary decision, though, since asking the wrong question may lead one to view results as negative when they actually aren't given the right question. For example, philosopher Elizabeth Lloyd argues that adaptationist investigators are often led astray by asking the limited question, what's the function of trait X, instead of the open question, how did trait X evolve? Blinded by their assumption that every trait is an adaptation, they fail to see that X could have evolved as a byproduct of adaptation Y, since they automatically view any byproduct explanation as a negative or null hypothesis rather than a productive one. Specifically, they characterize it incorrectly, make incorrect predictions from it, and thus dismiss as negative evidence what should be considered positive evidence according to the byproduct explanation of evolution. The aim of an investigator is also heavily influenced by value judgments and normative goals. For example, if investigators highly value avoiding the risk of announcing a false discovery, such as physicists in search of gravitational waves, they'll be more inclined to view results as negative than as positive, 
and they'll favor designing experiments more likely to produce negative results than positive results. Understanding the normative goals of the investigator is important because it can distinguish new types of results within what's commonly regarded as the homogenous category of negative results. For example, a normative goal of physicians is to improve the well-being of patients. So trials demonstrating the efficacy of a new treatment over a standard treatment or placebo are generally viewed as positive. And trials demonstrating the equivalence or inefficacy are generally viewed as negative. But philosopher Carol Lee argues that results of equivalence are not all the same. Since some equivalence trials may demonstrate that the new treatment has fewer side effects than the standard treatment, which should be valued as a positive result according to medicine's normative goals. Similarly, results of inefficacy are not all the same, since some trials may demonstrate that the standard treatment is less effective than a placebo, as opposed to the new treatment being less effective. This would also greatly impact patient care and so should be valued. Thus it's, thus it's inappropriate to lump all these results together under a singularly defined negative label. Clearly, the concept of negative results is ripe for philosophical analysis. In the current literature, the most sophisticated definitions mention the three flavors of inconclusive, unexpected, and contrary results but not acknowledge the influential factors of both scientific discipline and investigator aim. Identifying these additional categories of negative results aids in fully understanding the problem of publication bias, which is my next topic. Decisions concerning publication are extremely important since scientific journals represent the ultimate repository of shared scientific knowledge. Understandably, far more scientific studies are conducted than ever appear in print, and studies may be abandoned or rejected from publication for a variety of reasons, such as being poorly designed, uninteresting, or merely a first step towards a larger project. But studies presenting negative results are published so rarely. For example, scientific surveys, surveys of scientific journals have identified article ratios of negative results to positive results ranging anywhere from 1 to 10 to 1 to 32. One must conclude that the type of result presented influences whether an article is published. If one can predict the likelihood of publication for a study from one or more of its characteristics, then the set of published literature is a biased representation of knowledge obtained from research as a whole. Not all bias is bad, though. So-called selection bias based on certain characteristics like methodological soundness is desirable since it prevents results less likely to represent reality from joining the shared body of scientific knowledge. But when selection is based solely on the direction, positive versus negative, or statistical significance of study results, this bias, known as publication bias, has serious epistemic and ethical consequences. To an epistemologist, it's obvious that systematic selection against the publication of negative results seriously distorts the scientific community's view of reality. The body of shared scientific knowledge would no longer represent the total body of science actually performed. Some science would, in effect, be lost, relegated to an investigator's files, or thrown out entirely, which is why publication bias is often referred to as the file drawer problem. Only the remaining slanted body of scientific knowledge would be passed on to future generations of investigators. <coughs> Not only could the non-publication of negative results inhibit the growth of our shared scientific body of knowledge, it could also damage that body by leading to the wrong answer. Indeed, a major consequence of publication bias is an increased likelihood that published research findings are false when conclusiveness of a result is based solely on its statistical significance, typically p less than 0.05, then a non-existent relationship still has a 1 in 20 chance of being viewed as conclusive, as illustrated by this comic by xkcd.com.
In each of these panels, a different color of jelly bean is being tested. As you can see, one trial out of 20 yielded a positive result. <laughs> if the few studies reporting a statistically significant yet erroneous relationship are preferentially chosen for publication over the many studies correctly reporting the lack of such a relationship, meta-analysis over the domain of similar published studies produces a major overstatement of efficacy. For example, one survey found that the set of all FDA-registered antidepressant trials suggests only a modest overall efficacy of 51%, while a much smaller set of relevant published literature suggests a very high overall efficacy of 94%. That's almost a two-fold increase in efficacy when you move from conducted trials to published trials. For a second example, a meta-analytical survey of all animal modeling studies of human stroke interventions estimates that an additional 214 studies, or 16%, are missing from the published literature, which, if included, re would reduce the overall average efficacy of the interventions from 31% to 24%. <coughs> the relative overstatement of efficacy for individual interventions ranges from 2.7% for melatonin treatment to 124% for estrogen treatment. Thus, not publishing negative results based merely on the fact of their being negative is unsound science from an epistemological standpoint. But consequences of publication bias extend beyond epistemology to include significant ethical consequences as well. The lost science due to publication bias includes more than just the discarded results I've described. The investigator's time and effort, not to mention financial resources, are spent producing those results is wasted as well if nothing is gained from the suppressed findings. Theoretically, the individual researcher still benefits from her negative results if she can use them to direct her future research but she is the sole beneficiary when those results are not shared with others. Thus, resource waste is compounded each time an investigator unknowingly replicates another's unpublished findings. If a scientific community values efficient resource allocation and speedy scientific advancement, then regular publication of negative results is of great ethical importance. A second ethical concern of publication bias is directly related to the epistemological consequence of false conclusions. If published literature influences physician-prescribed treatments, then exaggerated efficacies due to publication bias could have devastating practical consequences on public health. For example, the 2004 Paxil scandal, sparked by Paxil being ranked by the World Health Organization in 2001, as the most difficult antidepressant to withdraw from, culminated in the state of New York plus over 5,000 individual patients <coughs> suing the parent pharmaceutical company Glazo Smith Klein for consumer fraud, since the company had promoted Paxil directly to consumers as non habit forming since 1992. In 2004, GSK settled for $2.5 million after legal discovery uncovered evidence of deliberate systematic suppression of unfavorable results. Most notoriously, Study 329, conducted in the U.S. from 1993 to 96 on 277 adolescents, the largest pediatric SSRI trial to date, was published with the conclusion that Paxil is generally well tolerated and effective for major depression in adolescents. When actual subpoenaed results indicated no difference in efficacy between the drug and placebo, and a four-fold increased risk of suicide for those on Paxil. Furthermore, a subpoenaed internal GSK document acknowledged that the results of study 329 were, quote, insufficiently robust to support a pediatric label change, and recommended the firm effectively manage the dissemination of these data in order to minimize any potential negative commercial impact. The document advised 
that positive results from study 329 will be published in abstract form, and a full manuscript would be prepared. But the document stressed it would be commercially unacceptable to include a statement that efficacy had not been demonstrated, as this would undermine the profile of Paxil. Thus, the study was published in 2001 with the outright false conclusion of Paxil tolerance and efficacy in adolescence. Given that ineffectual or inappropriately prescribed treatments represent great potential harm to patients, the medical community is understandably concerned with whether and how publication bias affects patient care. But this concern is a recent development with negative results routinely dismissed as worthless only 30 years ago. The first study of publication bias appeared in 1959 and criticized the 1 to 32 article ratio of negative results to positive results found in four leading psychology journals. And the first call for a journal of negative results as a solution to this perceived problem soon followed. Interestingly, all of the earliest publication bias studies and almost all the subsequent calls for negative results publication occurred only in the field of psychology. The argument put forth was that psychology had to correct its apparent bias against negative results in order to, quote, build up its empirical foundation as a science, with the underlying assumption being that the hard sciences had already accomplished this. And yet, no printed discussions of publication bias or the importance of negative results occurred outside of psychology until the early 1980s when the conversation began to take place in the context of medicine. There were, however, two humorous medical references to a journal of negative results prior to 1980. In 1962, an entertaining yet perplexing exchange appeared in the JAMA letters. Writing under a pseudonym, medical professor Sidney Schindel advertised the publication of the Journal of Negative Results, claiming, quote, the need for which has become increasingly apparent. Without elaborating on this need, Schindel outlined the new journal's contents, submission standards, and distribution plan. While most details resemble those of a legitimate journal, such as requiring that work not be published elsewhere, and that interested readers pay for a subscription, other details appear more suspicious, such as requiring author anonymity, and calling for reports of results not obtained and commentary on material which has been published elsewhere, but which shouldn't have been. Whether or not this was a serious journal proposal, JAMA editor Alfred Soffer certainly treated it as a joke. He first destroyed the anonymity of Schindel, then extolled the ironic benefits of such a publication. The articles would not have to be read, meaning considerable saving in time for the busy clinician or academician. No guilty feelings, no strained eyes, no divergence of opinions, since in any case, none of the published opinions would be valid. No additional references to Schindel's proposal exist in print, so one must assume that had this been a legitimate plan to found a new journal, it never came to fruition. The second humorous, though much less perplexing, reference to a journal of negative results occurred in 1971, when a physician insulted another's work by saying it belonged in such a journal. The author wrote an excellent article, but one that should either have appeared in the Journal of Negative Results or perhaps even Mad Comics. Obviously, he wasn't an avid reader of Mad Magazine. <laughs> the first serious discussion of the importance of negative results in medicine occurred in 1981, when, in an article on the problem of type 1 and 2 errors in clinical trials, a physician called for a negative results title section. He observed, the scientific need for the publication of negative or null difference results is apparent, and the <coughs> journal of negative results has been bandied around for many years as an almost sick joke. Such a journal would not only be decidedly dull, but also a financial catastrophe. Yet this problem is not insoluble. Negative results are of the greatest importance to the reviewer and there is no general need for their publication in full. So he concluded, a plea is made to medical journal editors to publish negative or null difference trials by title only rather than not at all. 
The accusedly boring and fiscally irresponsible Journal of Negative Results was not mentioned in print again until 1987, when Bruce Charlton, a professor of theoretical medicine and later editor of Medical Hypotheses, called for one in his letter to the new scientist. Acknowledging the problem of a, quote, inbuilt bias toward positive results present in the peer review process, he offered, the answer might be to bring to life that mythical beast dreamt of by embittered scientists, the Journal of Negative Results. We've all heard of it, we've all got papers we want to send it, yet it remains in the realms of folklore. Why on earth doesn't some enterprising publisher, but no, I'm raving. As a more reasonable option, he proposed that existing journals start including sections featuring abstracts of negative results with full details available to interested readers upon request. No journals added such a section, but at least one considered it, according to the reflections of a retiring editor. <coughs> the Archives of Surgery editorial board decided against including a negative results section because it would not be as entertaining as the journal of irreproducible results. <laughs> Science Humor magazine founded in 1955. And they agreed that the New England Journal of Medicine editorial belief that negative studies dealt with straw men. That is, these editors assumed that most negative results studies reported on factors completely unrelated to the condition in question, such as the hypothetical study that begins with the importance of hair color in men with prostate cancer has not been studied, and concludes with, our results show this is not an important factor. Ironically, this straw man hypothesis, used to reject negative results studies, most likely constru constructed straw men of those very studies. By the second half of the 1980s, medicine began recognizing publication bias as a problem to be studied, rather than just an inevitable consequence of scientific practice. The first medical publication bias study appeared in 1986 and compared the results of registered ovarian cancer chemotherapy trials with those that were both registered and published. Collectively, the published trials demonstrated a statistically st significant benefit of combination chemo over alkylating only chemo, while the registered trials did not. The authors of the study attributed this discrepancy to the favored publication of trials with positive results and they warned of the dangers of being misdirected by the limited set of published results. Two minor publication bias studies followed before the problem gained prominent status in 1990 with a JAMA <coughs> review article that demanded further study of publication bias to correct medicine's, quote, dearth of empirical evidence. <coughs> Since then, more than 50 publication bias studies have appeared in medical literature ranging from merely documenting the existence of the bias to also exploring the extent, source, and consequences of the problem, as well as possible solutions. The proposed solutions generally focus on what are seen to be the three sources of publication bias, researchers, journal editors, and authors, although researchers and authors tend to overlap. <coughs> Given the significant dangers to public health posed by false or suppressed medical information. Federal regulations of research, such as clinical trial registration, have been adopted to promote public access to all medical research. Following the 2004 Paxil scandal, the US has required since 2005 that all clinical trials of FDA-regulated products be registered prospectively at clinicaltrials.gov, a free searchable public registry and summaries of registered trial results have been required on the site since 2007. Other national and international registries have been founded as well, but since none require investigators to publish their registered results, registered studies with negative results are no more likely to appear in trusted peer-reviewed venues now than before these regulations were first imposed. Since medical journal editors are rightly viewed as the gatekeepers of published medical knowledge, it's no surprise that editorial guidelines have been proposed as a publication bias solution. The most prominent directive is the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors' inclusion of an obligation to publish negative studies in its uniform requirements for manuscripts, or URM. 
First added in 2004, the most recent version states, editors should seriously consider for publication any carefully done study of an important question relevant to their readers, whether the results for the primary or any additional outcome are statistically significant. Failure to submit or publish findings because of lack of statistical significance is an important cause of publication bias. The ICMJE is a group of 14 general medical journal editors who meet annually to revise and release the URM. Individual journals choose whether to adhere to these published requirements, and the ICMJE maintains a list of journals that request being recorded as following the URM. The introduction to the list, however, includes the following caveat. The ICMJE cannot verify the completeness or accuracy of this list. There may be some listed journals that do not follow all of the many recommendations and policies in this document. So while the ICMJE is an influential voice in matters of medical publishing, and 972 journals are listed as following the most recent version of the URM, it's unclear how many actually adhere to these unenforceable proclamations, including the obligation to publish negative studies. Another publication bias solution is to offer investigators a publication venue exclusively for negative results. But concerns of affordable storage and distribution of vast amounts of information stymied any hopes of establishing such a journal until online developments, including the internet expansion of the 1990s and the open access movement of the 2000s, all but eliminated these significant logistical obstacles. Consequently, Five medical negative <coughs> results journals have been founded online since 1997. These journals strive to publish full-length, peer-reviewed articles, except for NOGO, which publish short, unreviewed reports. But they all share the ongoing problem of extremely limited submissions. JNRM pub accepted but never published one article before disappearing, while ARJ Bio has published only four articles since its founding two years ago. According to its editor, NOGO published, quote, a few hundred reports during its five-year run, but most were submitted by the editor's own lap. And still, quote, contributions never rose above a trickle. JNRBM has arguably the most successful track record of the group, with a steady stream of publications over 10 years resulting in 93 total articles. Although PNR may soon surpass it, having published 45 articles in the last two years. But even so, a publication rate of only one to two articles per month is pretty slim compared to that of a traditional medical journal. If negative results are a natural and frequent product of methodologically sound experimentation, and these journals represent the only negative result publication options in medicine, why do they receive so few submissions? Simply put, investigators are motivated not to publish negative results. If an investigator devotes the amount of time and effort required to produce a full-length manuscript worthy of peer review, then she would understandably want to advance her career by publishing it in an already prestigious journal. But well aware of editorial biases against negative results, she knows that there is only a slim chance that a negative results manuscript would be accepted by a prestigious journal. She also knows that while a negative results journal would happily accept her manuscript, Publishing in a small, young, unknown <coughs> online journal would do little to advance your career. Theoretically, a negative results journal could publish more articles if it lowered its standards. For example, Nogo published several hundred short, unreviewed reports. But then the journal could no longer claim it was as scientifically rigorous as traditional journals. So it would never attain their level of prestige, and the source of submissions might eventually dry out, as it did with Nogo. An investigator may also be motivated not to publish negative results because she harbors concerns of research competition. She may want to cultivate a so-called successful reputation of producing only positive results. Or she may not want competitors to benefit from the time she, quote, wasted spent producing negative results. Given these incentives against publishing negative results, it's unsurprising that the medical negative results journals encounters strong investigator self-censorship. 
Even though these three categories of proposed publication bias solutions have fallen short of correcting the problem, medicine is unique in having attempted these fixes. In fact, as a self-conscious field of science, medicine is unique in even viewing publication bias as a problem to be fixed. True, there's some discussion in other fields of science about the importance of publishing negative results. The first complaints of publication bias were in the field of psychology, and online negative results journals have been founded in fields beyond medicine. But none of these scientific fields have experienced a community-wide movement with the same strength and magnitude as medicine has. I've located over 50 publication bias studies, and all but three are in the field of medicine. And even though the medical negative results journals struggle with limited submissions, their lifespans and submission rates, mean and mode, are significantly greater than those of the non-medical negative results journals. Obviously, every field of science is motivated to uncover the truth, and I've argued that publishing negative results is an essential part of that endeavor. So why is medicine the only field of science actively pursuing this goal? I view medicine as a community of inquirers, according to philosopher Helen Longino's social epistemology. The foundation of Longino's theory is her view of scientific evidence. Background assumptions are required to connect theory to data. Broadly speaking, background assumptions are values, which may be labeled as either constitutive or contextual. Constitutive values, such as simplicity or agreement with prior theories, are values, quote, generated from an understanding of the goals of scientific inquiry, and they provide rules for judging acceptable scientific method or practice. Contextual values, such as equality or fair distribution of benefits, are personal, social, or cultural values that, quote, belong to the social and cultural environment in which science is done. Historically, the philosophical school of logical positivism maintained that only constitutive values matter in science. But Longino argues that context, such as the authority or reputation of the speaker, is routinely brought in, even by logical positivists, to decide whether some evidence supports a particular hypothesis. Not all values are good values, and biased methods of inquiry can lead to badly flawed science. But background assumptions cannot be eliminated from science. They are, in fact, essential, since they play the crucial marriage-making role of linking evidence and theory. And scientific communities typically share the same set of values. For example, members of the medical community of inquirers share the practical contextual value of preventing potential harm to patients. And this is the impetus behind their changing appreciation of negative results. Oops. The duty to do no harm is sacrosanct in medicine. It provides the foundation for the professional code and education of the community. Every professional medical activity aims to prevent patient harm. And the community has begun to realize that knowledge of negative results is required for this aim. As I've argued, select publication of only positive results skews meta-analysis over similar published studies, which leads to greatly exaggerated efficacies of medical treatments and ineffectual or inappropriately prescribed treatments based on those exaggerated efficacies represent great potential harm to patients. True, the average physician doesn't have time to read the entire published literature, but she determines her prescribed treatments by partially relying on that literature in several ways. First, she may be influenced by the small but important minority of physicians who do read the published medical literature and act as the community opinion leaders. Second, she may get caught up in the media frenzy over a new miracle drug being praised in popular news outlets, sparked by one or more published studies. Third and most likely, she may listen to her drug representative of a pharmaceutical company who cites studies performed and are funded by that company in order to market a particular treatment. Many everyday physicians learn about new treatments solely from their drug reps, reps who are obviously motivated to be very biased. So these physicians will only hear the hype. They'll receive even more biased information than the already biased published literature. 
Thus, it's perfectly reasonable to claim that physicians' treatment prescriptions are influenced by the published literature, and that many physicians learn of the published studies in a biased way. In the community of medical inquirers, which includes physicians and related researchers, there is a growing awareness of a direct relationship between publication bias and potential harm. Since the mid-1980s, more than 50 studies have been published documenting the existence and extent of publication bias in medicine. And a growing number of everyday physicians are learning of these studies through continuing education meetings such as this one, as well as high-profile popular news media. And well-publicized scandals involving publication bias and the suppression of negative results, such as the Paxil scandal I've described, dictate the focus of community-wide discussion as well. All of this makes medicine unique. No other science has had a similar community-wide reaction to negative results. One may object that my view of medicine is overly generous and somewhat naive. Indeed, I've been told by some historians to drop the altruistic do-no-harm argument entirely and just focus on medicine as a business. While I'm unwilling to adopt the cynical philosophy that physicians of today care only about money, I concede that the desire to prevent patient harm may be motivated by many factors, including the avoidance of personal financial harm from expensive lawsuits and the burden of malpractice insurance as a consequence of patient harm. But whatever the true motivation, the outcome is the same. Medicine is beginning to demand access to all results including negative ones, to properly evaluate prescribed treatments. It doesn't matter why physicians can't afford to trust industry, their faith is still broken. One could object as well that other fields of science should also be motivated <coughs> to fix publication bias by publishing negative results, since, as I've argued, the inclusion of negative results in published literature is necessary to ensure an unbiased or true view of reality. Yet only the medical community has in fact pursued such an action, and this is the anomaly I explain. What distinguishes medicine from other fields of science is that it has an additional motivating factor, the practical contextual value of preventing harm to patients. And this key distinguishing feature has led medicine to begin to embrace negative results when other sciences aren't. Negative results have always been thrown out in science, but now they're not being thrown out quite as much in medicine. This is a fascinating story that hasn't been told before. Thank you. Mm -hmm.